Well, hey, everybody. Hey, East Lake. Thanks for tuning in. This is our first conversation of 2023. I'm Peter. We haven't met before. I'm joined as always by my good friend, Kristen. And we're really excited that we get to have, I would call Kent a guest, but I don't even think that's accurate anymore. We're just like a recurring character on the sitcom. You know, Kent Dobson is here with us today. We're really excited to have um, you join us. Thank you for being here, Kent. Are you joining us from home? Are you Michigan? Yep, I'm in Michigan. At home. Warm and cozy fire behind you. Yeah. Just looking so scenic. It's perfect. <laughs> um, before I pepper Kent with questions, Chris and I have been thinking a lot about this discussion. Um, and we're going to have some questions for Kent. That's why we invited him, obviously. I want to do just a, a little bit of an intro to kind of remind everybody about what we're up to. Um, hopefully, I mean, obviously, it's the first conversation of the new year. Happy New Year to everybody. Hopefully, you are entering um, this new year with some hope about what this year might hold for you. Um, but ultimately, like we have these conversations, Kristen and I do, um, East Lake does these conversations, facilitates these discussions because we really want to help people live a meaningful life. That is kind of the business that we're in. We want people to experience love and purpose. And hopefully um, as you're listening to these discussions, you can experience some motivation or inspiration, um, some tools to navigate the stresses of your day. Um, and as always, hopefully you can um, be more hopeful about the future and how you can contribute to a more beneficial um, place that we can all be a part of. Uh, but as we're thinking about 2023, Chris and I were thinking, all right, how do we help people live a more meaningful life? What topics should we discuss? What ideas might help? And we keep coming back to the idea of rituals. And we uh, have both read this book and some of our leadership team have read this book. We've already hopefully promoted and you've heard about the book from Stasha Sagan. For small creatures such as we, and it's essentially a book focused on what are some rituals or idea, like essentially habits or things that we can be participating in throughout the year that would help us live a more meaningful life. So that book's been on our brain. So what we wanted to do as we're kicking off our first kind of conversation is to have a discussion with Kent Dobson today on the topic mm -hmm. of rituals. You were the first person, Kent, that came to mind. We didn't really have a backup, so I'm really glad that you said yes to having this discussion. <laughs> um, but the first person that came to mind when we're thinking of like, all right, what's somebody that might have something interesting to say about rituals? So for those people that are listening, I'm not sure if you even like how you would even like what comes to mind. How do you fill the definition of the word rituals? So we wanted to kind of make this a very simple start to our discussion and make this kind of a rituals 101 for those of you that are listening and you're like, I don't even know what a ritual is. And that's like a word that I don't use very often. Um, Kristen, what are you thinking when I'm saying all this stuff? <laughs> well, before we get to Kent, I think I also wanted to add to what you just said, which is, you know, we've kind of announced, we're not going to go back to this, like mm -hmm. somewhat regular Sunday morning gatherings um, that we're kind of looking to forge kind of a new model of what church and community can be. And I think part of that speaks to this ritual conversation in that for many of us, we understood ritual just within a Christian context of church gathering. And so for me, my history with ritual is I understand ritual to be communion, worship, baptism, and all the things that were kind of packaged within this church environment. And so I think what the conversation we're having is, is, is that, can we expand that view? And was that view small to begin with? And so I think um, I agree with what Peter said. We were really interested to have Kent kind of kick off this conversation with us to kind of have a deeper, more expanded view, or even maybe in some cases, a simpler view. I don't know. Let's see where it takes us. But Ken, we wanted to, we're really glad that you're here to help us have um, this conversation to kick off the year. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. <clears throat> yeah, this is something um, that's sort of in my wheelhouse of interest. And, um, you know, like the two of you, I have some experience in Christian religious communities and the kind of ritual associations and rhythms that are part of that. And also I've, I've been out of that. So I've had so in and out of that world. Um, but more, more recently, just the deep structure of how human beings experience a meaningful life has been what I've been after really. And um, not only just personally, 
Uh, but it's a communal question, you know, and the and ritual is a communal question, really, in in my opinion. I suppose when you could imagine uh, a kind of privatized ritual life, and that's true. I mean, everyone has patterns, and 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 it'll be interesting to see what happens with East Lake if you say, okay, we're not going to do our regular Sunday morning thing. So I would say, well, what's going to happen, you know, because part of what Part of the attractive energy is, in fact, the pattern, the the rhythm, the routine, and people feel its absence when it's not there. And um, but it's 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 interesting terrain to to be exploring right now, and and we almost have to because um, the I don't know media culture, mass consumer culture is filling the space. It's filling the ritual <laughs> space. So now I haven't really said what I mean by ritual yet, but I'll I'll try to maybe work into that. But um, yeah, I um, and feel free to interrupt me or you know ask for clarification. That won't that won't bother me. But I already I, have one. Okay, yeah, <laughs> you can hit me with a question. You know, then I'll try to define. Uh, yeah, no, I, I love that. Even even what you're saying, like kind of feeling like we have to, because that's partly where we're we're treading the waters we're treading in in 23 is. Um, doing essentially these kinds of pieces online and providing content doing some things in person still so there'll be like events and ways to get together but the, the model and the community doesn't seem to it just doesn't seem to make sense to do essentially 40 sunday morning services anymore given the makeup of the community the makeup of how donations operate like that model just doesn't function in the same way that it, it did a decade ago for east like it might still for other communities but in this one it doesn't and so when you say things like the, the media has filled some of the ritual space, I'm just kind of curious what your thoughts are there. Like, what do you mean by that? Are you meaning just well, podcasts in general or uh, what, what kind well, of media comes to your mind? Uh, well, I was thinking about the Starbucks cup, you know, that appears in somewhere in uh, October or November that tells us that Christmas is coming. You know, uh, change yes. from white to red, and you're like, oh my God, you know. But <laughs> yes. but actually most of that is unconscious and there's a shift, you know, there's a shift that's happening. And and people can feel the shift like just in a in the earth rhythms themselves. And so um that's what I mean by culture. It's taking these things and saying, we're gonna give you, we're gonna play into this space. I'm not even saying they're doing it on purpose, but maybe they are, but we're gonna play into this space here and we're yeah. gonna provide patterns of meaning that are going to connect you to you know to sentimentality but also just to the rhythms of nature and also mm -hmm. um, to the relationship between buying something and meaning that's partly mm -hmm. what I mean by consumer culture it says okay yeah. we know how this game works meaning is bought and so mm -hmm. we're going to sell you a vibe I mean mm -hmm. yeah like like uh like let's just take Starbucks for example in some sort of critical taste test it's not necessarily the best coffee yet, but that's not what people are interested in, really. They're right. interested in the vibe of being in the place or the rhythm of buying it every day and, you know, that kind of thing. I'm pretty sure Starbucks did, is doing it on purpose <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because I don't buy it. I don't buy Starbucks except for at Christmas time. <laughs> they totally got me. I'm like the cups. It's time. Yeah. Yeah, and I got I got I had some I got some Starbucks gift cards. Um this this episode is brought to you by Starbucks. <laughs> Clearly, I wish no, but I got some gift started. cards and I'm excited, you know. I'm like, yes, you know, here we go. Um yeah, and I mean I maybe we don't need to say more than that because I think people can use their imagination for ways in which consumer culture is filling those spaces. Yeah. Um okay, so I wanted to try to say some really simple things about how rituals came to be and what they are. Um, first of all, you can hear the word rite, as in rite of passage inside ritual. That's probably in the book that you're suggesting. I didn't read the book, but um, it's a, and that that means like uh, some kind of regular, I, I would use the word play, like, um, like a theater, like a kind of enactment of something some sort of regular routine enactment as a that's a rite um and and a ritual is is you know little rites or big rites 
little rites of passage or, um, and okay, so uh, more could be said about that, but I think the question of how they got formed is where I have some, I guess this is more of my opinion. So I think two things are important. That, that meaning, part of how we experience meaning as human beings is that we experience our life being rooted in something larger. That's like what I would think of as meaning with a capital M. People feel the, and it's a felt somatic, intellectual, spiritual, full-bodied um, experience of meaning when we're connected to something larger. You know, it's like, and anything could apply to that. You have your first child and you're like, this is not about me. That, well, what's it about? It's something larger, you know, or like the classic, you know, you go to your first concert of your favorite band and everybody's singing the song, you know, that's a, that's a kind of ritual, but what's working about it is that it's connecting you to something larger, even if it's, you know, cold play, you know, it's still bigger. Even if it's cold play. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I just meant like, that's not the Pope. That's not the Pope. You know, correct, I love it. Correct. <laughs> And I think I people do. claim that that they hate Coldplay. It's a shadow claim. It, deep inside, they want to stand there and just say it's all it's all yellow. Come on. You know? It's all yellow. Right? How do you resist? So, anyway, so I don't think an effective ritual. There's no such thing as an effective ritual that doesn't connect us to something larger, because and without an experience of something larger then we kind of despair or become narcissists. You know, it's like, if they're, that's, that's, that's a kind of existential turn. There's nothing more meaningful or everything is meaningless. You can despair or you can turn into a narcissist. Maybe those, maybe two more, you know, swing back and forth, something like that. Um, and I would say th the other part to this, it goes something like this, that, um, the larger or the transcendent is also too much for us to bear. Hmm. So we need meaning, we need experiences of meaning, but it's also too much. It's like why in the Bible, you can't, um, you know, Moses can't look at the face of God or he'll die. You know, well, why, why, why not? Be, isn't God your buddy? Be like, hey man, you know, let's go out for a beer. Let's get some Starbucks, you know? Um, but it's not like that. The transcendent, the truly mysterious is um has a has a sort of frightening dimension to it and can be too much to bear can overwhelm you so a ritual says we'll provide enough of a container so mm -hmm. we we can feel part of something larger but also not be overwhelmed you know um so anyway th that's kind of the problem that i think rituals are rituals are trying to 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 respond to and they they don't get they don't get created like um, you don't workshop a ritual like hey guys let's, you know what should we do next week you know to celebrate the solstice you know and I don't know this this and this they just kind of emerge they emerge as people experience um, uh, I don't know what you would call it like numinous encounters mysteries places you know they they're it's the summer solstice and the mountain light falls a certain way in the valley and it's kind of magical mm -hmm. and that becomes a place that that people start gathering and and they they start adding to how can we enhance our participation in this mystery and not get too close to it but close enough where we can sort of taste what's meaningful does it have I made sense so far questions like what what do you mm -hmm. think two things <laughs> when I think of the summer solstice, all I think is about is naked bike riders in Fremont because that is one of the things that happens here. That was one they workshop. That's a workshop for sure. <laughs> they workshop. Maybe, it. maybe they but, emerge. <laughs> but that's that was one of my questions. What you said is, um, but can it be workshopped? Can you kind of say, hmm, how do I want to celebrate the? summer solstice or the winter solstice how do I want to celebrate like can we be um intentional about 
remembering things through ritual or developing our own. Hmm. Yeah, I, I guess I'll give a kind of um, uh, non-answer, which is sort of like yes and no. Yeah. Like, yes, I think we can bring our conscious, sophisticated 21st century mind to bear. And, and we have to in a way, because part of Part of what's happening in the 21st century is, is rituals are losing their meaning for people. And that's mm -hmm. that's partly just because they get old after a while, you could say, but it's also part of the scientific mind and the, the kind of obsession with with scientific rationalism. And and we say, well, these don't work, you know, that what are these magic spells or something? So, and we can't get out of that. It's hard to get out of that. And I'm I'm not even saying we should necessarily. But yeah, so I guess, I guess you can start to wonder well, can we create new expressions of things? <laughs> but on the other hand, the most meaningful rituals are meaningful because you don't make them up. Hmm. Hmm. Otherwise, the ego is in, your own personal ego is in charge or the ego of your guru, you know, or your leader or, and what they cooked up 25 minutes ago. And, you know, and, but when you're in the presence of something that, I'll give you a weird example. So there's this um, there's there's this uh, event that happens every year in the Church of the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem. So this is the main church in the heart of Jerusalem, and this is an Orthodox Church thing. So and it's called something like the Holy Fire. All right. And so what happens is that the priests go into the chamber, into the innermost realm of the chamber. And with a torch, and they claim that the spirit lights the fire, um, and then they bring it out, and then it gets passed around, and people all have candles, and they all kind of try to cram into the church, and sometimes there are fights and all kinds of other like crazy <laughs> things that happen. It's, it's, it's a very non-Western kind of tradition, mm. but then it sort of spreads through the whole church, and then through the whole all the streets of Jerusalem, who's ever a part of the festival, they're trying to, to, to pass on this light. Now, you could never make that up or compete with that if you're just going to like, hey, next, this, this year, we're going to do a ritual, you know, and we're going to, yeah, you, know, you just can't compete with that because how did that get formed? I don't even know, but it's something like 1700 years old and it is meaningful. Now, to what does it point? That's the realm of theology, you know. Does it point to something that's true? Does it connect people to meaning and, you know, and what kind of meaning and, um, but it definitely works. It's, and, and, you know, that kind of thing, like speaking of Coldplay, you know, it's a tradition now, now, well, now people use their phones, but they, you know, they're, they're holding up their lights and where did that come from? In part, it came from what I'm describing in the Greek Orthodox church. It's, it's a religious act of that symbolizes light entering darkness. And that's like a deep human craving. And that's where I say it's probably more, if I took you there to this thing, you'd be like, oh my God, this is insane, you know? Yeah. So anyway. That makes sense. I heard you say, yes, you could, but it seems as if the most meaningful or impactful ones emerge, right? They're ones that came out of an experience. They're ones that have, came out of an experience thousands of years ago that we can again pull ourselves or feel a part of not only our current people but I can feel connected like I'm imagining being a part of that it's not just I'm connected to this candle lighting in Jerusalem today it's I'm connected to people for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years who've done this every year right my family my, my great great grandpa I don't even remember his name but I know he did this tradition and that is obviously a, a lot more significant than some Kristen and I brainstorm on this call right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay here's something else that's coming up for me is as you're speaking well do rituals have patterns like that's the, the question that i'm interested because i i let you know i'm into comparative religion and other kinds of spirituality and things like this so so i want to say well what patterns are present across religious traditions or even non-religious traditions and I, and here are the big ones birth <laughs> Birth needs rituals, death, um, 
transitional spaces like coming of age things um, or illness sometimes. Um, and then for our ancestors, and this is probably why, why we, partly why we feel so empty, why our rituals feel empty. For our ancestors, it would it involved the earth. It involved the seasons as the main. That's the main orientation for almost all rituals. Even birth and death, you could fit into you know a cyclical, seasonal, earth based frame. So, and well, that gives you a clue. So even if you're going to consider, well, what are some? What are are there contemporary, modern, twenty first century expressions of ritual? Yeah, probably. But if they're not, if they're not in conversation with with the seasons um, and with the big rites of passage as human beings, like birth and death and marriage and divorce, you could say now. And I mean, wouldn't it be amazing? Divorce, I don't know what your community is like, but for people my age, it's like, it's it's the norm, not the exception now. That loss of, of long-term intimate relationships is the norm. And so we probably need rituals for that. Ending as much as beginning and mm -hmm. Because I think it's become almost like normalized, like, well, you know, if this happens, shit happens and 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 go to your personal therapist and kind of work things out when it really calls for communal rituals that involve grief and and loss and longing and perhaps new possibilities. And yeah, that's that's a realm that needs needs some creative attention, you could say. So um, so my main seasonal connection and like the rites of passage as human beings, those are the, the ritual spaces that I think are most meaningful for people. Hey everyone, it's Kristen. Just wanted to take a moment to say thank you for tuning in. I hope that you're finding these messages helpful for you in your everyday life. Um, that's what we're trying to do here is gather around the idea that life is a gift and love is the point and let's give ourselves ways to move forward in that in our own everyday world. Um, so I wanted to take a moment to say thank you for being a part of this community. To those of you who have participated and given financially, we want to say thank you to you. Everything that we do here happens because people make contributions. People say, I value this place. I want it to exist for me and for other people and so I'm going to support it. And so we just want to say how grateful we are um, that you do that. And for those of you who maybe haven't had a chance to contribute yet, um, we would ask you to consider maybe doing so. If you find this place beneficial, if you find these messages helpful for you, then um, consider joining us in that way. You can go to eastlakecc.com to make a contribution. Um, and we just always are thankful for the people who want this place to exist. So thanks again for tuning in. Let's get back to the message. I guess it's interesting because I was thinking about how this, how much the seasons are viewed differently today than they were even 100 years, 200 years ago. Um, so the seasons, Chris and I had a discussion about how, um, and this came up in the book, right? The, the first strawberry of spring felt a lot different than the first strawberry of like. There's no first strawberry of spring in my life, right? I, I can have strawberries today. It's January. Um, and it might not be the best place of strawberry and I didn't grow it, but I can have access to it. And even just the idea of light, um, like I have in my home, I have ongoing kind of teasing discussions with my mom and my sister. They like the house darker than I do. And I just like it bright. I want more lights on. I want it on until I go to bed and then it's all off, but I don't want to like conserve certain sections of the house with light I want more light and I was thinking that that is just a modern privilege right like you in some ways the the seasons or I would I would imagine the rituals helped kind of move people through the seasons and I don't know if I need some of those rituals as much because I can of our modern conveniences if that makes sense I don't I don't need the the hope of the new light or the longer day as much as I would have maybe wanted that ritual in January or in December when, when it was so dark and I was knowing that I had darkness in front of me for two more months, if that made sense. Yeah. 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 And and I was wondering if that's not a form of impoverishment, you know, if, they, if, mm. if, if some element of the soul isn't impoverished because of our advances, so to speak, you know? Right. Yeah. Not a privilege as much as a detriment. Yeah. 
Yeah. I just wonder, I mean, it, that might not be true for all people, but there is a sense where the modern world creates sameness. Like you're describing, you can have the, all the, you, your, the light can be constant in your house. The temperature can be constant in your house. You know, your days can be consistent. Even the idea of like the work rhythm, there's no work rhythm. It's just like you're working and you're not working, you know, and it's just boom, yeah. it's all flat. Maybe you get a vacation in there, but mostly it's just a flat life. And that's not how we evolved. 100% that's not how we evolved. And so you wonder why people feel so much despair. You know, it's like, this doesn't yeah. make sense. And, and probably why some, why we're, why we're drawn to go to church, even if we don't really believe, believe the stuff that's being said, it's like, it breaks the monotony, mm. you know, and it says, mm. okay, well, we're talking about Matthew, you know, some ancient book on a Sunday, and I'm going to go there or whatever, I'm going to tune in and, and there it is. And it's breaking the monotony and reminding me of something else. And yeah. Um, yeah, so maybe we should go a little bit further with the seasons because what what I kind of hear you saying in the background is maybe you're not saying it, but I guess it's just bringing it up for me. All right, maybe that world is gone. You know, I know what a. That's so interesting because I was just thinking, maybe it's recognizing that that world is still here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that would be more my interest too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This, um, and that the ritual, you know, like provides the container to recognize what always has been. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, well, I was like, thinking, I just wanted to say, I appreciate, I'm just stuck on what you said earlier about how um, the container, because what is larger and meaningful is too much. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. that was really powerful to me. And I think, like the things that you just said, birth and death and divorce and coming of age, they're just, they're too much. Yeah. And I think that's, I'm thankful for your perspective on that because I think that's why we crave the rituals to try to get through the too much, yeah. um, right. to, yeah. to make it graspable or tangible or able to be held um i think is what we're trying to do because we want the meaningful part of it but the meaning can just be too overwhelming so um i think what i'm hearing you say or what you said sparked in me was just i do like i have that need to like grasp how powerful birth is but then I can't, it's too much and it's too much to experience. So having little fragmented things to help me understand it is, is part of being able to even experience it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it incarnates um, what is essentially mysterious in palatable forms. That's why I kind of, I, I was, when I was talking about a rite as a kind of play, it lets you play inside the space, yeah. but um, has enough form and structure that that you're not overwhelmed. Like I was, it's all of a sudden I had this image. Like when my dad died a few years ago, and um, and there was all this talk about what the funerals should be like and the service and all this kind of stuff. And and that's complicated. That's really complicated terrain for anyone that's had a, a loved one that's passed away because you know it's obviously not about them at a certain point they're gone so you have like all these like expectations and and i and i could feel that i didn't have many when it came to the public service but i had this feeling that at the graveside i wanted to throw dirt on the coffin mm. and my dad was buried in this kind of like kind of terrible modern way where they're just like putting you in a concrete box essentially it's very um, it's very modern. It's, it's, it, there's something wrong about it. And, uh, and even like, just to take a little side detour, um, a friend of mine died when I was, a, when I was a, living in Israel, when I was a, a student, he, and he was also in Israel too. And, and, um, and the church that I went to asked for volunteers to dig the grave, you know, like, Hey, you know, <laughs> Phil died this week. We need some extra hands. You know, does anyone have a pickaxe, stuff like that? The ground's pretty mm -hmm. hard. And literally the community dug the grave. They 
took the body in a Volkswagen bus from the morgue to the gravesite, mm -hmm. wrapped him up in a cloth, put an American flag over him because he served in Vietnam and lowered him down with ropes. Like, mm -hmm. you don't see that anymore, you know? Yeah. But anyway, like I can feel myself getting emotional about that. It's like, God, that's a ritual, you know? Yeah. And, and we rob people of that kind of meaning when it's so um, cleaned up. Yeah. Like don't so much like humans. Don't leave it all behind closed doors. So you don't mm -hmm. have to see anything except the prettied up um, chemical filled body, you know, with makeup. And that's what, and then everything else is being pretty. So anyway, I just had this feeling like at the very least, I want to throw dirt on the coffin. And it was amazing. Mm -hmm. It was my it was like the best moment. And my nephew, he was like into it. Like, yeah. Kind of funny too, because he's like a couple of handfuls in there, you know. But yeah. that was, that was, gave me a window into, in a way, now that I'm thinking of it now, why ritual connects us to these, a sense of the transcendent. Like, it's not about me. It's also about my nephew. It's about the deceased. There's a, there's a continuation here. And that's where I'm going to go. From dust you came to dust you shall return, you know, that's yeah. going to be me in like five seconds. Um, but yeah, th and so we need that stuff. Otherwise, I don't know, a Facebook post about someone that died is just not going to cut it. Right. That's such a, thanks for sharing that. That's yeah. a, such a meaningful example. I, I'm curious, even as I'm hearing you share that, do you feel like that version of a death ritual is that? modern day is that american or a combination of um, like america's or our modern day like trying to prevent the experience like how do you think we got to the place where it be like that death ritual is like kind of taken away from the human and get outsourced to a business <laughs> that sounds pretty american but yeah yeah i don't know i mean this would be probably something i shouldn't riff on too much um because <laughs> sure. I'll, i'm not yeah. trying to yeah <laughs> yeah People are doing the best they can, and um, sure. given uh, the loss of community and culture that's happening, you know, it, it wasn't that long ago that when you died, if you're religious, you know, the community really was much more a part of it, and you were buried in the church graveyard, for that matter. So, right, we just that world is pretty much gone, and and um, but I mean, to yeah, I think there is a a strong denial of death meme and theme in our, in our current world. It's like, we don't know what to do with it. So we deny that it happens. And, and some of that is theological, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. uh, don't worry they're they're, you know, playing soccer with the Lord or whatever. <laughs> and, and it's, and that doesn't quite, you know, sound right to most of us, but that's a kind of denial of death. And even, even I'm not against people having hope in an afterlife. I'm really not. And, and whether or not you believe in that, but it's, it's like, it does help us keep at arm's length from what you, what's called in the Bible, gathering to your ancestors, um, being gathered to your fathers and mothers. And they meant that literally, they literally put all the bones in the same tomb. So when you buried grandma, you saw your great grandparents' bones still there, and you knew that's where you're going to go, and and there, that's meaningful. That is really meaningful, and you can't make that up. You know, um, yeah. I was going to take it a direction, Kristen. Do you do you have a thought, or do you want? I don't want to just keep going my path. I want to make sure that I'm giving space for wherever your brain's going. <laughs> no, I'm just thinking about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wanted to go back to what I feel like you two were both speaking to, because maybe I didn't quite fully grasp it. Because Kristen mentioned like some of the ritual pointing to the world that's always been there. And, and, and you said like maybe that world doesn't exist anymore, if you think about it. Like, and, and part of it, I think, is how do, and part of this discussion is what's the role of ritual today? And, and what maybe prevents us if you think about, even the examples I gave about light or, you know, sameness, um, what kind of gets in the way of us adopting ritual? Like given the conversations that you have in the people in your life, um, I was, I think part of why I'm 
how wanting to have discussion of rituals. Like I'm not sure I'm as intentional as I was in years past in marking the seasons. And I, I kind of just let the church do that on my behalf. Um, and I followed those rituals and I felt like I kind of checked the box of, yay, I'm, 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 I have my rhythms, whether they were meaningful or not, whether I thought about them or not, but at least I was doing something. And I feel like as I've moved worldview wise away from just following Christianity as my, you know, as the curriculum for my ritual life, um, maybe I'm less intentional in, in kind of forming my own. So I'm, I'm curious maybe to, to pivot the discussion towards how do we, do you have examples in your life of people who are really intentional with their rituals? Do you feel like you are personally um, are, would say that like you have a couple of rituals that you're like, these are really meaningful to me. Um, or I'm kind of just curious your thoughts on like, how do we adopt this more or how do we get more intentional about this um, in 2023? Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. Cause I'm, I'm a lot better at theorizing and spinning tales and myths and connecting things in the sure. web. <laughs> um, that's okay. If you're like, I'm not sure to, how to answer that one. We, it's okay for you to that to be your answer. Um, yeah. We're well, going to keep digging at this all year. <laughs> I would say I, I have a, a hunger. So I have a hunger for, I know left to my own devices, I'm likely to get stuck in cul-de-sacs and dead ends. And so I'm I'm attracted to ritual. And sometimes I think about rituals as having two two faces. One is the big stuff, kind of like what we've been talking about up to this point, and and the other is kind of the daily piece. And I would really put the daily piece more, in my, at least in my view, like in the realm of prayer, like in the largest sense of that word. What's what's a daily way of reorienting? Because I would think about prayer as the same way. It's a kind of ritual where it's connecting us to the transcendent and it's <laughs> addicts know this pretty well. I don't know if you read Russell's Russell Brand's book on addiction, but um, one of the things I, I, I got from him and I kind of feel that I, I, I feel myself craving this sort of thing is he starts every day with very specific rituals. Like, well, now he does an ice bath, but let's say he does an ice bath. He lights these candles. He starts with a prayer that's something like, I'm an addict and I, I'm in need of help, you know, and he goes about his day. And that's not nothing. That's, um, first yeah. of all, maybe it's a little bit of freestyle, like he's a kind of spiritually fluid person, you could say. I mean, I don't know how he would describe his own spirituality, but the actual acts like lighting a candle, saying a specific prayer, those are old. Those are as old as any religion on earth. So um, yeah, I have some daily practices that have a little more to do with reading and a kind of certain way of reading. I learned from the Dominican sisters uh, initially, Lexio Divina, maybe you've talked about it at East Lake, I don't know, but sort of the divine divine reading is what it means. But it's like yeah. you read a certain way as so as to listen to a word or a phrase and just allow, allow what I now would call the unconscious to be involved or the spirit, you know, in this. Not reading for information because I'm really good at that. But so, but if I, if I can shift toward, I'm going to listen differently and, um, and, as an act of submission in a way, because again, we're talking about the transcendent, you know, it's not, it's not my, I'm not in control. I'm not in control of my, even my own life really. So some kind of daily way of listening and speaking, I'm not that great at prayer that it makes me a little uncomfortable, you know, like if you were to ask me to pray right now, I'd be like, ah, no, no, thanks. But, um, I did that. Is my yeah, I try to do more than my hangups, but I feel the need for it. And sometimes I do. Sometimes, sometimes it's really that simple. And that's a, that's a daily ritual. And, and then the other stuff is like, I went to an Advent service that the Dominicans put on um, this year. That was new for me. Like I, I went to a, a kind of religious organization, you know, and, and did four weeks of Advent. I don't know why, because I wanted to. And also because I didn't have to make it up, you know, when you're in the religious business, like giving talks and it's very hard to, to, to take your own medicine, 
you know, because you, yeah. you know, what's in the medicine, you know, so it's like, it's, and when you're, when I, when you're hosting something, it's different than participating. So, um, I do try to look at the year a little bit and say, um, what are the big markers? Like for me, for my family, a family one is Thanksgiving. We have turned Thanksgiving into the major holiday that we celebrate, you know, not that we dress up like pilgrims and native <laughs> people no, i just mean like we put time and money and effort and we like it mm. and we light candles and we invite people and and we say yes to it and it's and partly why it works is because it's cultural but also seasonal you know it's it feels like the right time of year our body our deep the deep body says yes to it it's like mm. yeah finally um it's time to eat squash because that's when it's ready that's, that's right. why. and even right. if we're not aware of it um what made you land on thanksgiving and what what when you say family like how do you involve like what does that look like just for an example for somebody listening um, inviting um, is that like friends giving kind of thing is it broad well, no, i don't do that i don't do that <laughs> I'm, I'm, i don't have the uh, my house is not an open door <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's I'm kind of curious, like, what... like that um no i mean it, my wife, my kids, my extended immediate family that lives here. This year, her brothers uh, came up from Georgia. And so, yeah, we try to say yes and and open our doors. Yeah. And, yeah. and we, like it. we like cooking. We like awesome. um, doing it. And it's almost better. Maybe this might be a simple, back to the simple expressions of rituals. It's hard to say if they're good or bad. You know, like, do we bring moral categories? But I do know that when you consent and say yes, then then it tends to grow in its capacity to help us experience meaning. And we know this as kids, like when you're half-heartedly going to some Christmas Eve service, you know, all right, that's that's what you're going to get out of it. Fine. All right. Then do that. But if you're going to do it, then do it and say, yeah, try to open to something larger. This is not about me. And, um, and I don't know why Thanksgiving too. It's also seems like very, very little of life. Do we say, I can't believe I'm still alive and mm -hmm. I didn't make all this food and how did I even end up here? At least it's supposed to help point toward that. Yeah. Beautiful. I've got one more actually, because- Great. Um, okay, so another thing that, you know, I, I lead wilderness programs and things like this, and one of the practices is a kind of form of, of an ancient ritual, which is the vision fast, which is fasting alone in the, the wilderness for a few days. It's part of the core curriculum at Animus Valley Institute, where I've done all my guide training and stuff. Um, and so I think, what is that? What is a vision fast? It's not a yearly ritual, necessarily. I mean, although you have religious traditions that fast. It's one of those um, archetypal passages. You know, maybe a reason it was for young people or transitional, it's a transitional space. It says, I don't know what I'm doing with my life or I'm none sure, or I have this deep longing I can't quite connect with, but there's so much input and noise and volume and food and alcohol and drugs and that I can't get close to it. So the vision fast, which exists in every culture that I know of, some version of it exists. They might not call it vision, um, but it's something like that, you know? And so you say, no, because I can feel that I'm going to need another one soon. <laughs> I've done a couple of them, but I can feel that. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm going to need another one soon. And and that's going to take a year or so of preparation, really. Not that I'm going to be doing it every day, but just like, yeah, all right, this is coming. And I'm going to say yes to it. And and then it's a, the self-emptying. That's the fast. You know, you empty yourself so that you for the possibility of being filled by, by God, mystery, nature, the unknown, not my phone, you know, and certainly not Twitter and what it says is important. That is mm -hmm. not important. And we know that in a deep way. So um, that's an example of a, of a ritual that communities have held that I think can be revived. And it's also not, it's not particularly embedded in any 
any religious yeah. tradition. So go on a vision fast, you know, yeah. you don't have to do it with animus, you know, you can do self-designed versions of these things. Um, it's sometimes best to involve a few people where um, there's a context for sharing what may or may not happen from something like this. But yeah. anyway, that that's like a, an example of a ritual and that's been important for me. And I, it will be as I approach these little like times where I'm just not sure what's next. So it's a great example. I have a very random modern day comment. <laughs> okay. So I saw this thing, this happened to me, and then I saw it on social media and I was like, yes, thank you someone for pointing this out. Um, I had a moment when I was buying clothes for my kids at Target for my son, who's the oldest. And there's a moment where I had to move. It's called, and the ritual that they pointed out on social media was crossing the aisle where you leave the baby clothes and you have to cross the aisle and go to the big kid clothes. Mm -hmm. And I had a moment where I was teary in target because my son was bigger than a 5t. So off I went, crossed the aisle. Yeah. And then I, and I, I didn't recognize what was happening really to me. I just was sad for a moment. Um, and then I saw this thing on social media that was like the moms when you cross the aisle at Target and how this is like a moment where you don't have a baby anymore. You have a kid. And I think for me, there was something there of like, I just, I needed some help to recognize what was happening, which was, I don't know, maybe this is like a coming of age thing in a small sense for my boy of like, He's not a baby. He's now a boy. And I don't know what then comes after that. But I was just kind of, as you were talking about some of these like deeper things, I think part for me, I really appreciated the, the help noticing the everyday things that are already happening. Mm -hmm. And I, mm -hmm. um, so I think I would just wanted to put that out there to both of you and yeah. just to say like, I don't know why that was really meaningful for me that someone gave me a context for why I was emotional when I had to cross the aisle. Yeah. Yeah. I love that story. Great example. And um, imagine if we lived in a village where something other than a social media post deepened that deepened that kind of natural um progression you know because yeah. what's happening grief you can never get that back never yeah. it's done you're offering your child to the world now in a different way and and that's what and that's what ancient cultures were really good at they were really good at that's you know um that's what the village the village elders were for and there were rites and rituals for all that kind of stuff and and it's sad it's sad. Mm -hmm. It's sad that that it's that it's lost. And and maybe to answer your both of you are poking around in this, like, is it just over or is it not over? You know, is <laughs> like, can we go back? Can we not go back? Yeah. Can we create them again? Right? Who's going to be the elders that brain like didn't those okay, guys so, brainstorm it? <laughs> see, I think one reason why they will never go away is because they're rooted in in nature. Yeah. We right yeah. now the 24 hour light lights on cycle it's a facade i mean it's actually happening but it's 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 a facade it's not it's masking the fact that the reality yeah, yeah. coal is being burned to make that happen or in your part of the wood or uh, world uh, it's probably water it's probably dams hydroelectric electric it masks yeah. that it's costing us something and um that won't last forever Nature wins, you know, it always wins and it, it will break us from our malaise eventually. And I'm, I'm not being even too apocalyptic. I'm saying even, even the human spirit will eventually say, no, I think that's going to happen with the metaverse. You know, the human soul is not in sold incarnated in a, in a virtual realm. So eventually people will just say, fuck it. 
you know, yeah. I'm out here or something like that. Yeah. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a Gen Xer and that's what we normally say. About <laughs> I just, I believe in the human spirit and I believe in nature. You know, I believe that, that you'll be, yeah, it's like you'll cross the aisle and target in your metaverse mm-hmm. target and yeah. then you'll feel that, you know. Yeah. Like, well, and it's the, you can't, yeah, it's just, I'm going to feel that somewhere, mm-hmm. the loss of my baby and the the losing of time or the just the feelings of being proud of having a growing child, you know, like all those things, those, those all happen. Um, but yeah. it is a little bit sad that it's just like me standing in the aisle by myself. Having yeah. that vision. <laughs> imagine though, imagine this. Um, this happened at a target in um rome all right so you you and i are at the target in rome there's no such no, no target in rome. <laughs> we're using our imagination here and and um you have this feeling and you say to me oh this, i don't know why i'm crying i just crossed the aisle and i said oh i have an idea let's go to the vatican so we go to the vatican and we walk in we walk in the front door of the sistine chapel and to the right there's um michelangelo's paeta which is the the marble statue of mary holding jesus mm-hmm. yeah and and then we would light a candle yeah and yeah and we'd know we know that life is that short And we know it's that meaningful, you know, it's like you, I don't know. It's like you, you give your kids away. You're like, God, see, <clears throat> that's what I mean. Like, I don't know when Michelangelo lived, but that was a while ago <laughs> and the Vatican's been standing in a while and that would enhance our experience of being part of something larger. And that's why I don't think, you know, I, I don't know. I think religion is changing. I think, I don't know what's exactly happening. It's kind of dissolving on the one hand. And, you know, I I don't know. People are clinging on the other hand, but I would mourn the day the Vatican got turned into hip apartments, you know, be like, yeah, it's over, you know, and someone will tear that down and say, we can't live like this. So to answer your question, yeah collectively communally maybe from the deep unconscious rituals will continue to i think provide some shape yeah and it's the other the other forms we haven't talked about this but it's like ideological fervor is taking the place of those maps you know like meaning i'm a part of some political party or group or you know it's that religious instinct, which is kind of what it is for meaning. It's like, we're just given these cheaper versions of it, you know, be a, be a part of the red state or the blue state, you know? It was like just, sports teams check some of those boxes too, right? Like if you think about, I'm a Ohio state Buckeye fan, right? It's like this tribal identity and it like, there's the rituals, there's the roots, there's all the, the sun. I show up on Saturday. I go do like, there's so much like ritualistic um, behavior in there that I think um, it's a modern version of it, but it kind of is void of the soul for the most, uh, although maybe some, I don't know, like th- then that starts to get pretty subjective, right? Cause there's probably some that would say it's, it's spiritual. <laughs> well, it is spiritual. It is spiritual in a way, but it's just thin, you know? Yeah. It's like, uh, yeah. And, and it's kind of accidental. Like, why do I like Michigan? Cause that's where I live. You know, I mean, yeah, but that's all Sorry I to bring up Ohio yeah. State. My, my apologies. That was a mistake. <laughs> Sorry yeah, about that last the other day. <laughs> um, but it, you, we, you know, part of us knows it's just accidental. It's kind of true with religion, too. Like, why am I a Christian? You know, I'm like, well, it's my zip code in, in part, yeah. my family heritage that I didn't choose. And, um, but sports is just a thin version, you know. Someday I want to go and watch a Liverpool match and, you know, and stand there and and sing the opening song i mean you know i'll i'll I'll, it'll it'll be emotional but i'll also know part of me is like all right 
it's, it's still, a game. It's just a game with millions yeah. of dollars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> millions, yeah. <actually. clears throat> I love what you shared. I think as we're wrapping, Kristen, um, I, I had a couple biggest take oh yeah some of my biggest takeaways from your your thoughts can thank you for sharing these first of all yeah. um always find you insightful and you're such a teacher for our community you've been so for a long time and for me personally so i hope you hear that like thank you mm -hmm. some of my biggest takeaways today was just being reminded of how critical like the a meaningful life is found first and foremost in connecting to something larger um and how rituals help facilitate that i thought that was just obviously basic and, and 101 when it comes to rituals but for those of us that are listening like that is if you're feeling like man i want a more meaningful life it's going to be found through connecting to something bigger right um and there's a lot of things that are bigger than just ourselves individually but i found that helpful and then i also find some of your thoughts just on how rituals aren't going away they might be shifting they might be changing but that's a part of the human impulse the human impulse will always be to um i think connect to something larger and that those routines or those um not i mean obviously i'm just looking for a different word for rituals essentially the rituals that stick around are the ones that connect us to something larger and um how critical those are to our flourishing and so i just appreciate your, your thoughts on that did you have big takeaways kb um I'm still emotional about Target. <laughs> I know. That made you cry. Target and Rome. Good. It was um, beautiful. And it made yeah. myself cry. Yeah. I can't believe no. they put that Target up. I'm so glad they put it next to Vatican. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, thanks, Kent. Thanks for the way that you bring meaning to things and make us think. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Do you have any closing thoughts before we wrap? I think it was really helpful kind of kick off to the year when when we think through rituals. Okay, if you don't, if you shared all you got, but if there's anything you feel like you missed, we want to give you a little window too. Not really. I just, um, you know, here's a line from Thomas Merton. Um, he said of the of the the desert fathers and mothers, which he kind of helped recover for the modern world. He was reading all these strange mystics third century, fourth century mystics. And <clears throat> anyway, he said, for the desert fathers and mothers, he said, um, society is a shipwreck from which we must swim for our lives. And um, I think we're in that kind of place. And I don't even mean that in an apocalyptic way or to be against Starbucks or something like that. I just yeah. mean, in terms of its meaning systems, it's a shipwreck. Yeah. And, and um, so we got to swim. And and part of the swimming is, you know, religious communities, spiritual communities, just families, individuals wrestling with the, all the things we're talking about. Like, okay, well, where, where is meaning and how can we connect to it? And, um, and that's where I think ritual provides a kind of on-ramp and, or you could say an off-ramp from, uh, yeah. from society, you know, so we can do a U-turn and, and swim in the opposite direction. And really is going to take that. I, I think, I think one of the things that evangelicalism got wrong is that, um, and maybe just modern Christianity in general, it said, Hey, let's just keep living the same life we have. And then we'll sprinkle some Jesus in there and we'll call it good. It doesn't work. You know, it's like the, it, the, the 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 deep structure of meaning is doesn't of our of a consumeristic culture you could say and I'm I'm not even against all things like that I just mean the beast that is that runs the machine is antithetical to to the deeper sources of truth and meaning and so you need off ramps and you got to yeah. swim in the opposite direction and and um having a daily ritual, even like to make it simple, taking an ice bath and lighting that candle and say, I'm not in charge. That is swimming in the opposite direction rather than checking your phone and saying, I'm going to allow an algorithm to tell me what's important. That's handing yeah. over your life. And yeah. who would do that? I don't want to do that. Even though it's like fun, you know? Yeah. It's so maybe that's a place to land. I think it's a great place to land. Thanks for sharing, Ken. Really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for having me.
Thank you for joining us. To make a donation, head to eastlakecc.com slash donate.